change, change. It's a sure thing, change, change. Expect a miracle, change. Watch me change when you change the way you look at things. The things you look at change. When you change the way you look at things. The things you look at change. When you change the way you look at things. The things you look at change. Hello and welcome to Spirit Cafe. I'm Barbara Schreiner Trudell and my co-host Cheryl Rogers is on vacation today. So we have a special guest co-host today. Well, let us begin with the land acknowledgement and we are honored to work, live and play on the historical and traditional territory of many indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabe and Wendat peoples and more recently the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Haudenosaunee nations. And as we gather from many places on Turtle Island, we as settlers are grateful for the opportunity to meet here. And we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We acknowledge the indigenous stewards of this land. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and other indigenous people have made both in shaping and strengthening our country and all of Turtle Island. By making this acknowledgement, we strive to be allies and take an active part in reconciliation by honoring the land, the history, and the unique Indigenous heritage of our First People. We recognize our oneness, we realize our history, and we choose to create a new reality. We are one. Miigwech. Well, my co-host today is C. Driscoll. C., welcome, welcome. So glad you could join me today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Oh, so grateful to have you here. Well, I just want to introduce our guest today. Our guest is Dr. Anne Terrio. Uh, and in high school, she had a dream to go to space and more exactly to step on another planetary surface. So in college, she figured out that one way to achieve this dream would be to have a career in planetary geology. We call her the rock doctor. Well, she suggested, <laughs> she said that to me and I loved it. <laughs> she gathered, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny, the rock doctor, I like it. <laughs> she gathered the skills and education required, including learning English, to end up in 1988 as the first French Canadian summer intern at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas. Her work on shock metamorphism effects in rocks from impact structures propelled her forward. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Working as a research assistant at NASA's Johnson Space Center and making her one of only five world experts in the world of shock metamorphism during the 1990s and early 2000s. Wow, this is one smart lady. She obtained her PhD from the University of Ottawa in 2001 while working full time and starting her family. Two of her three kids were born between her comprehensive and her thesis de defense. Wow. Well, and her thesis, her PhD thesis, she studied the rocks from another big impact structure, the Sudbury structure in Ontario. And that's pretty close to us. Uh, during her career as an accomplished scientist, accomplished policy analyst, and accomplished manager, Dr. Terrio has been active as a respected and trusted union steward for the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada at Natural Resources Canada. Her love for science continues to live via her public and school or university talks and guest speaking to cover the subjects of impact cratering, meteorites, and general geology. Her passion for healthy and safe workplaces shines via her talks on mental health. That's a big one these days. And wanting to be close to nature and enjoy its benefits. 
Uh, it, she moved in August 2020 to LaSalle with her amazing spouse, Cheryl, also known as C, who is our <laughs> guest co-host today. Well, welcome, C. Welcome, Anne. Dr. Anne is in the house, the rock doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got lots to discuss today, and we were chatting prior to the show, and we were talking a little bit about the book of Genesis. You, you had an interesting little factoid about that that I kind of liked. Yeah, um, when you look at the first chapter of Genesis, when it describes the creation of earth and sky in those six days the actual first three days are geologically correct it's like it's the actual timing that we recognize in the science that we have so i'm i'm presuming that that specific chapter was written by a bunch of scientists way back then <laughs> I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. Now, you've been uh, studying what's going on in Sudbury, what's happened there. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, the impact there and what that and how big it is? Man, you shared that with me the other day. That's it's huge. Yeah. So so when you <clears throat> when you look at the uh, formation of the Earth, uh, when you look at the solar system, for example, so what do we look up is we see the moon. So when you see, you look at the moon, you see these big dark spots on the moon and they haven't changed because the moon has not changed in about 3 billion years. But those big dark spots you see are impact craters. And so as the solar system was creating, the objects flying into space, if you want, would bump into each other. And so we have the, as we look at the moon and we see that the moon is cribbled by these impacts, then we said, well, the earth must have been too, because we're essentially are in the same space in space. Yeah. So when we start yeah. looking for those scars on earth, you don't see them, right? You see all these oceans and you see the continents, but you don't see the, these big scars. That's because the earth is actually a living planet and it's re uh, forming its its land, its crust. And so the old, old crust that would have been there during the moon is no longer really available for us to see. We have bits and pieces in Australia, in South, Amer in South Africa, and in Canada. So the Canadian Shield has the oldest rock on Earth that's about 4 billion years old. Wow. So when you think that half of that, which is 2 billion, is where Sudbury comes into play. And mm -hmm. so Sudbury at 2 billion years, as far as the rocks are concerned, it's already after most of what we see on the moon. So that the, the impacts and the things that are happening are, are, have already subsided. Like, you know, today you look at it and you don't see a, a meteorite hitting us every day that's creating a big crater, right? So these things have gone. So in the time of Sudbury, that's about 2 billion years ago, an object this of about um, 20, uh, let me see, I have to remember, was it uh, it's 20 times its size? So t about 10 kilometers in diameter, and we don't have that many of those anymore, hit the ground in the Sudbury area and created a crater of about 200 kilometers in diameter. So wow. 200 to, to 250. So that's pretty big. And w when you when you can, if you can picture yourself, uh, if you've been in um, uh, La Malbe in Quebec, or you've seen the crater, meteor crater in Arizona, you can actually see a bowl and there's a hole in the ground where the the object created. So in, in La Malbe, as you get to La Malbe, you're at the edge of the crater and Mont des Eboulements is actually the center where there's actually a peak. So it looks like a sombrero, if you want. Oh, okay. Like a, a sombrero. That's in Quebec. So suddenly, huge sombrero that was very thin, but that was 200 kilometers in diameter. <laughs> so 
it it's very old and what happened in Sudbury is that the rocks melted and then they recrystallized and that's how we were able to pull together the um metals and the and the minerals that that have been the ores that came from Sudbury so all the the platinum the nickel all these things in Sudbury are thanks to the impact right and didn't that help create the crust because back then there was no land yet right so that's it so if you think about it if you, you if you think of genesis and it says that it started from darkness that God was in the darkness also, and it everything created out of darkness. And then first we had uh, the seas and the sky. And the seas is that the sea was actually a, a magma pool. So the earth is actually a ball of fire. And that ball of fire is being hit by different things and has... When you think that the, the, the ocean floor, we don't see it, right? It's underwater. It's a heavy, it's, it's a very thin crust underwater. And that the continents are floating on this. How did we get to have continents? And that's the, the impacts happening into this ocean crust enabled for this differentiation and for the continents to, to be created. So billions of years ago before Sudbury, so the first cross was created thanks to the impacts that were happening in order for our our surface to look different than just a land of water you know like a, a, a planet of water so that's how we got the, the cross wow. wasn't canada the first crust Yes. So, well, that's the first crust. That's the, the, the oldest crust that we can find in, uh, in the slave province, uh, Northwest territories. We have the oldest rocks on earth that are 4.3 billion years old. And, um, we do have in Austria, they have minerals that are that old, but they don't have the rock that it came from. So we know that there was crust before that, but it's been, reprocessed and like i said because the earth is a is a living planet things get reashed and re and reprocessed and so when you when you heard me say that the earth was a fireball well the earth has also been a snowball because you were talking about possibly what how can climate change get into this picture right so yes. <laughs> I think the easiest way for me is would be for you guys to picture a 12 hour clock. Mm -hmm. And on that 12 hour clock, two minutes before 12 is really the time where the humans have come into play. But for all of this other time, the earth has been a fireball and a snowball and then a heat ball and then a snowball on its own, just because of the processes within the earth itself. So the fact that humans come into play in the last two minutes is that we've been accelerating that process. So we're seeing climate change much more quickly happening than we actually have seen on the earth. So when I was telling you about what we see on the moon is actually giving us that gap from, from zero hour to about two hour, we can see from the moon what's happening in the solar system because we don't have those rocks anymore on Earth. We have our oldest rocks is at about two, two thirty, and after that we see that as the Earth is trying to form its crust, it's it's forming its oceans, it's forming its atmosphere. It's at about six, uh, just past six o'clock that we have the Earth starting to look like what we know it today. And then as, as the land is forming, as the life is appearing in, in the waters, then the, the actual crust start building. So if you want to picture the Ottawa in the Toronto area, in, it, 400 million years ago, which is still twice the age of the dinosaurs, 400 million years ago, we essentially have the, 
the Canadian Shield has a barren land. It's rocks. You have yeah. beaches. You're being suntanned nicely because we're down at, at about the uh, the tropics at the level that the cross was at the time. Yeah. But there's no plants. There's nothing. It's a barren land and you have the oceans. It takes another 200 million years before we can actually see flourishment on those continents with plants and the dinosaurs going around. Cool. So what are the what are the odds of another <laughs> another meteor hitting? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, when when we look at the, the impact crater um, record, we see that big major impacts have happened every 50 million years or so. Okay. The last big one was 55 million years ago. So you'd think that we're due 5 million. <laughs> but but, but the thing is that, yeah, well, the, big, the, the last big one was in, is uh, Popegai in, uh, in Russia, if I remember well. And the thing is that when we look for these big things, so the, the rule of thumb is that an object will create 20 times its size a crater. So in order to have something major, we have to have something that's going to be, you know, uh, five, you know, if you think that the object is five meters, it's not going to make a big difference with, you know, a hundred, a one kilometer hole is a small hole. So yeah. we have to have something much bigger. So those objects, we know where they are right now. When you look at the solar system, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have your, the sun, the first planet is Mercury, you have Venus, you have the Earth, you have Mars, then you have Jupiter and all the other Jovian planets. But between Jupiter and Mars, you have the asteroid belt. And so those are the objects that we have to be worried about as to how can they bump out of their orbits to actually manage to cross ours and, and hit us. Plus, they, there are some of those asteroids are called uh, near Earth objects. So those are the ones that come close to us that, you know, somebody, an amateur will, uh, astronomer will say, hey, there's something coming towards us or something just went by us. Right. And they're not that big. The big ones, we know where they are and they're not in any way, shape or form close to be coming to towards us. Um, if you recall, in 1994, the comet Shoemaker-Levy. So mm -hmm. now if I'm taking you outside at the edge of the solar system, where we call it the Oort cloud and what these mm -hmm. objects coming out of dark, those comets. In 1994, in June, the comet that came into the solar system was actually grabbed by the gravity of Jupiter and it hit into Jupiter. And when we look at the pieces, the fragments of that comet and the holes they made in Jupiter, the, and we named the fragments A, B, C, D in, in letters, the, the fragment G created a hole in the atmosphere of Jupiter that would have encompassed the entire Earth. So, wow. <laughs> so the good thing is that Jupiter is a big shield, and so it, it is protecting us that the, the comets are coming in because they are attracted by the gravity of the sun. So they're coming to round around the sun. If we happen to be in that path, it's going to hit us. But if mm -hmm. Jupiter comes along before, it grabs it and it protects us. So mm -hmm. comets is something else that we don't have a good grasp as to how many and where they are, but they're not very frequent. And when we see them entering the solar system, we have time to prepare for when they're going to actually come to us. So, no. should we should we worry that the the sky is falling on our heads? No, I don't <laughs> worry. I well at night, I don't I don't have to worry. Yeah. And um, but is it possible? It's possible, but there's the the risks are not very high right now because there's no such object coming at us. Oh. Phew, good news. <laughs> yeah. I better pay my visa bill again. 
And Anne, isn't isn't the crater in Chicxulub, Mexico, the one that took out the dinosaurs? Oh yeah. So when you think that 200, well, so between 200 million years ago and 66 million years ago, so for about 150 million years, the the dinosaurs were the authority on planet Earth as you know the the living form. Uh, when you think that they did for 150 million years and us poor humans have only been here for like, <laughs> you know, essentially two minutes, but um, which is a couple of thousand years, you know, it's, it's nothing, right? So or these me. poor dinosaurs, they, they got hit by an object that was about 10 kilometers in diameter, a 10 kilometer diameter object. You know, we know them, there's, it's, it's they're not coming, but in in uh, 66 about 66 million years ago, this object hit the the Yucatan Peninsula on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, and created a, a diameter impact similar to the size of Sudbury. So now, instead of being two billion years ago when there was not anything really going on on the surface of the Earth, now you have a major impact and it provides enough change and affects enough stuff in our system that it it first because of the heat because of the energy of this impact localized and on a continental continental base you have wildfires things are burning so you, you anything that was there just is cinched so after that, because you actually created a hole, if you've seen the movie, um, The Day After Tomorrow, when you see this example in the, in the movie of this uh, spiral and this hole created in the atmosphere, saying that the higher stress stratosphere is bringing down cold air, well, that's what an impact does. It creates a hole into the atmosphere and punches out the the air for you know like a hole and so you're bringing down very high temperature i mean very low temperature onto the ground so you sort of have a flash freeze but on top of that with everything that's gone into the atmosphere as far as dust and debris from the 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 impact and the burnout and all this stuff you you have a cover, you know, if you think of the volcanoes and how the dark cloud and then for a couple of days that you can't see the haze is there. And, and so that prevents the sun rays from coming in and that creates a nuclear win winter effect. So you have sort of like the, the double whammy, it's too hot and then it gets to be too cold. And then most of the, the life forms that were there in six, 65 million years ago, especially the big ones, could not adjust. Okay. And the poor mammals that were small, all that they had to do was find a big dinosaur carcass and live for a couple of times because we, they were omnivores, right? So the plants were having a hard time doing their photosynthesis. So if you were an her herbivore, you were getting out of luck. If you're a carnivore, well, you did have a lot of carcasses to find, but at one point they would end. So the the dinosaurs, because of their requirements, because of their size, could not sustain that change. And the smaller life forms, especially the ones that were most uh, ambivalent and be able to do a lot of stuff, were able to find ways to adapt and continue on. Wow. And it's interesting how adaptation is kind of what happens, you know, continually. There's constantly a, a shift that occurs where we have to adapt to the environment as we see it today because things are changing all the time. There's constant, like yeah. you say, it's a living planet. It's constantly evolving. And I know when we went into lockdown for COVID, wow, everything flourished. It was like, take the human out of the story. And all of a sudden, we have wildlife, we have lots of grasses and flowers. It was beautiful. So we're a, a bit of a mess when it comes to what we're doing to the planet. Yeah. I, I think that... Long to recover. The recovery no. happened very fast. 
very fast. Yes. And, and so to think that humans are, I don't know for, for what reason and, and, and what's the drive, but we, we have gotten ourselves out of flow with the planet yes. that gave us life. So how, how can we, you know, because I think because we've lost track of what is our real purpose and what are we in, in flow with this planet that we've put ourselves first <laughs> type of thing. And now we're causing, we're causing a buck because it is out of, it is out of flow. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for the greater oneness and the greater good and the system, right? We're a part of this system. Yeah, I think sometimes we sort of think that we are um, we are the system and everything else should revolve around us rather than the other way around. And consumerism seems to be the uh, yeah. the thing people are striving for. So that's kind of putting us in a bit of a messy uh, messy place to say. I'm, I'm smiling and I'm laughing because when you read the second chapter of Genesis. Yes. Man comes first. So it's like that's yeah. and that's what create, you know, and that's where it's in Genesis 2 that you have the tree of knowledge and, and evil. And you don't have that in the first one. So yeah, if you in the first one you stay in flow, everything is good. And, you know, for those six days, everything is good. And then it goes on forever because the seventh day doesn't have an end. Yes. So if you actually abide by that first chapter of Genesis, everything is fine. But for some reason, somebody wrote chapter two. <laughs> and well, we did. and it actually, we're part of that. I know. And it actually shows what humans are doing. It's like, don't, don't put the human slant to this, this story and it's fine. But if you do, then look what happens. <laughs> And if we would return to the ways of our indigenous people, you know, that that creates a much more sustainable world. You know, use what you need, live in harmony with the land and the people like there's something beautiful about that. We're going to go on a little break here. We're going to take a minute and a half, two minutes. You're watching Spirit Cafe and we will be right back. Don't go away. New Thought Media Network. We are a global broadcast network of positive music, media, and entertainment. Inspiring humanity's evolution along the journey of enlightenment and creating a world of love, peace, empowerment, and prosperity for all. New Thought Media Network, positively inspiring. Network is on the rise. We're looking to grow with you. Do you have technical media experience or perhaps a desire to learn? Are you willing to volunteer your precious time and attention? We share this message to benefit all. If you possess a computer with a camera and a microphone, we will share our knowledge with you. Behind the scenes or being the star, let us bless our one. Contact us at info at ntmedia.org.
And welcome back to Spirit Cafe. Our guest, Anne Terrio, is just absolutely giving us all kinds of great information and a little bit about the Bible as well and the joy of uh, humanity and what we're doing to our planet. Now, one of the things I noticed in your bio as well is that you do some work creating healthy workplaces and dealing with mental health. Uh, given what we've come through with the COVID and sort of the interruptions that that happened, what are some of the things you're seeing in the workforce today that um, needs to be uh, <laughs> worked on or addressed uh, moving forward with our mental health? Right. Um, well, it, it took me about one year into COVID and working from home and being someone that has lived experience with depression came February, 2021. And I was going, what's going on with me? It's like, this is not depression. What is it? It's like, man, I f I'm languishing. I'm, I'm lacking motivation. But if you would have not known depression, you would have thought, oh, I'm, I'm depressed. Yeah. But what happened to me was that working at home, although I, I was sharing my house with a lovely person and, and, pets and stuff, working from home alone, I had lost my bearings as to how to energize myself and motivate myself. So to be in the office, to see different people every day dressed head to toe <laughs> with yes. clothes and stuff, um, even though I did not interact with them, just crossing their energy fields was motivation to be able to see people working side by side to be able to say okay i i can focus this person is focusing it was motivation so uh in 2021 i started asking people how do you how do you do it how do you keep yourself motivated during the day do you remember to chill or are you just back to back to back to back and working on this stuff on your computer and so some people start saying oh my god it's we can take a break. <laughs> yes, you have to. It's good for you. Yeah. So we start sharing tricks. So people would say that they they went outside to to take a walk or to clear up some weeds, to, to walk a pet, um, that they would be listening to music. Uh, that they would call someone for a virtual coffee. Um, so they found ways to motivate themselves. And so I said, okay, I need to do the same for myself. And so that was the one bit. The other bit was that we all went home without a manual as to how yes. to behave. And mm -hmm. a lot of us created this, what I call the imaginary punch clock right next to your computer. And every time you get up, you went ka -chink, you know, I'm no longer at work. And then you come back and ka -chink. when you work in the workplace and you get up, in my case, the printer was only a few steps away. But if I got up to go to the printer and we're in this cubicle of, you know, the sea cubicles, yeah. uh, I would get someone to see me and say, oh, and you're here. Can you answer this question? And so I would take the time, answer the question. Then I would see someone that I had not seen in, in a long time. So I would take the time to take their pulse. And then I would go to the printer to realize that, oh, I forgot to press print, go back. And so it could take me more than, you know, I, I, I laugh, but it could take me an hour to do this thing. Yeah. Well, when I finally got back to my desk, did I ask myself, oh, I just wasted an hour. I'm going to have to stay on another hour. It was part of my workplace. It was part of making it safe and healthy. So then if you are at home and you get up to go for a pee and you see that there's dishes in, in the sink, hopefully it's the dishes of the day and not the dishes of the week, and you take the time to do the dishes for five minutes, Mm -hmm. It's it's only a good mental break. It it for me it's an accomplishment. I see things are done, and really, do you turn off your brain while you're doing the dishes? No, you're thinking of the email that you're about to write, or you're think, thinking of the project that you are on. So then, why would you have this punch clock? So it's just part of making sure that your environmental your environment and which is now your work environment is healthy and safe, and if you're sharing. The house with someone, it's not like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm at work, I can't talk to you. Uh, it's like this person is part of your workplace. Please. So you, you have to hide. 
right? Yeah, that's that's great information. I know because even I have a 17 year old daughter. And so uh, it was myself and my husband and her, the three of us in the house. And, you know, we did we did really well trying new things like she learned how to bake bread and and uh, just coming up with different ways. But I know for me, pulling myself away from the computers always been a little bit of a <clears throat> tough one. You know, it's like you wake up in the morning and into the office, turn on the laptop. And so I'm breaking that now going, no, no, no. We start with some other things yeah. first, uh, making you sure know, that it's balance. The unions, when they created or they managed to get this 15 minute break in the morning and the 15 minute break in the afternoon, it was because it was based on studies to show that taking a mental break, taking a break away is only good for you. And then to take time at lunchtime to break away and take half an hour at the minimum is yeah. only healthy for your for your whole body not and your soul, not just, you know, uh, I have to take a break. And now that we are at home, it's not because or that we are, we are working remotely. It's not because we're working remotely that these don't apply taking a break is not because when you were in office, you had to go and take a break. It's because it was recognized as something being healthy. If I, if I could change those breaks to taking five minute breaks every hour, it would be even better because yeah. that now the study shows that taking a five minute break, even if it's to do two minutes of meditation every hour is much more healthy and it will help you perform better. And so going home, people stop taking their breaks. Why? Why? They're still there. It's And then they're important. Yeah, it's interesting how we um, didn't really adapt. We just sort of got dumped in. It happened fast. And I don't think anybody really knew how to manage it. And so here we are. And now as we're looking at getting back out into you know, gatherings, there's some resistance around that as well. I don't know if the two of you have noticed that. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, when when I've done in-person services, you know, I, I might get 10 people out, but I still have, you know, 15 or 20 online. Um, are you noticing yeah. that as well, C? Oh, yeah. It's, it's the convenience of being in your pajamas to go to a Sunday service or a Monday night service. <laughs> people are more tired than we were allowed to be before. We weren't allowed to be at home. We weren't allowed to, the conveniences that we've been able to see because of COVID. So a, a lot of people will never go back yeah. because they need the comfort of home, their tea, their coffee, just chilling on the chair, watching their favorite speaker. And, you know, it, it just works for them. But yeah. there will be groups of people who will go back and they're coming more and more. You'll see that they will come. You know, because yeah, at one yeah. point that will not suit everybody who's been languishing in that now. You know? Yes. Yeah. I, I know for and, me. And you I'm do have connection. Yeah, no, sorry. And and you do have you do have the people that became so so complacent in that position that for them now that's another so you know, it was a major change to go from from what we were used to to being forced into something that we did not expect. And now we have people that are afraid of the change again and anxious about the change. And how is that gonna, and so a lot of, if you look at how many people have been seeking help for um, uh, mental health before COVID, and now how many people are, are seeking help now, it, it oh. hasn't slowed down. It, and it's because of this too much change. Um, it's the, someone was talking to me about this this morning and I forgot the term, but it's, you, you, we've been burned out by, by, by change. And so yeah. it's not just, uh, being unable to adapt is that it's just too much. It's a surcharge. That's it. It's a surcharge on our system. And we did not allow ourselves to actually embrace each of the change to be able to go on and replenish our resources. And I think people are are still like I hear a lot of people talking about wanting to get back to normal. 
And for me, that's kind of like, well, number one, normal doesn't exist. It's different for everybody. <laughs> so it's not really a thing. And the thing is, we're never going backwards. We're always moving forward. Like the universe is something that's always moving in a forward motion, I think, anyway. And as such, going backwards would be kind of redundant. Like we don't, what we were doing back there wasn't so great. You know, what we need to do. <laughs> We need to create something better, something, you know, some kind of brighter future moving forward. And I think maybe returning to the land, uh, doing more in that way rather than consume uh, massive quantities of anything and everything. What do you think? Yeah, coming back into flow. Uh, and, yeah. And, yeah. and to be able to recognize that... Uh, connections physical connections are required yes. to, to the three of us seeing each other on the screen today because we actually interact at the end we would just say hey i saw i saw barb today and she looked good and she, i saw she should be doing well but i never asked you so how yes. can i actually know right so yeah. you it's not because you see someone on the screen that you can say, oh, I saw Cheryl. She was at the talk last week. She's doing fine. No, we actually have to be able to be in connection and over yeah. the, the video and over the phone is one thing, but to actually be together, to be able to take the real pause because you can, yeah. you can hide behind the video. You can hide behind the voice and, and you, people may not be able to really detect how well or unwell you are doing. Yeah, it's true. And I think a physical touch is such an important thing. And that got taken away. And I think that's probably had a massive impact on the overall mental health of people. Like we're seeing uh, an upswing in, in violent acts and things, uh, at least here in Toronto on the TTC, uh, as sort of something that's, you know, really unusual that people are choosing to you know stab somebody they don't even know uh you know does that seem to you like because of that lack of connection that that's creating a bit of uh anxiety or anger or whatever that's now being perpetrated on just anybody for the sake of i'm angry and i need to act out i i don't know you know there's been well, shifts though as well mm -hmm. uh, the earth shifting quite dramatically right now i'm feeling a lot more heightened energy mm -hmm. and people who don't know how to look at that and observe it as opposed to react with it yeah. then they're going to overreact but when you can observe the heightened energy and as an energy therapist it's just like crazy the amount of energy that's coming right now oh, oh it's huge mm -hmm. it's huge mm -hmm. yeah i i'm yeah. feeling that as well go ahead Anne. now i i think that yes there's an element to that definitely but um, the, the, the rage, maybe, the, the energy rage that people are feeling, to me, maybe a lot of it has to do with the lack of control. You know how control and acceptance and safety and security are the, the main pillar to, to balance. Well, the fact that we were not in control of having to stay home. Uh, not in control of, you know, vaccinate, no, don't vaccinate, not in control of where this came from, not in control of not being able to go where I wanted when I wanted to. And so all of this lack of control may be at the source of a lot of the anger out there because people, yeah. have, which they had control over, suddenly was taken from them. Yeah, everything, you know, having to wear masks, whether you want to or not, getting vaccinated or getting fired, those were your options. Um, you know, I think those things really have taken their toll. And I don't think we've gotten over it yet. You no. know, and now no. they're talking about, you know, children who are getting sick. And so there's just there's a lot of fear. There's no control over anything. You can't even go to the store and buy the things you're accustomed to buying when you want to buy them. No. Sometimes it's just not no. available. Right. So we're yeah, I think you're right. And that idea of control is uh, yeah, we've lost it. 
I'm not sure we ever actually had it, but we had the illusion of it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and now we're back in the real world. So what we want to do is then get into the flow, which would allow us then to live in a more conscious state in harmony with whatever's going on around us rather than in opposition to it. Yeah. And you know, the Buddhists have that flow thing down to a science because they took yeah. the sound of the cedar trees in the Himalaya mountains, because yeah. they're all one root system and they're in a constant state of growing, developing a natural flow, healthy flow. And yeah. they took that sound, they called it Om. Yes. And Om get is really interesting. Later was discovered by a scientist named Schumann. Yeah. And he called it the Schumann resonance. So when yeah. you chant Om, which is the healthy vibration between the earth and the edge of the ionosphere, you start to feel connected yes. and in flow. And it's such a perfect, easy healing. It's about 3.87 hertz or 72 whatever hertz. And you can yeah. find the sound everywhere. But yeah. it is so beautiful. And it really brings you back to your natural uh, capacity um, just to be and to be still. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, the OM is so powerful. I can still remember the very first time I heard somebody chanting the OM and what that did. Like my whole body was vibrating from <laughs> that energy and it was like man I'm, I'm gonna liken this <laughs> this is better than alcohol or anything like this is kind of feeling it is, it is. Yeah. but you can't get you can't get people off the you know i tried i got a family friend there who just won't drop the alcohol for the home and that's a struggle but anyways you know i just want to ask Anne if that's okay um about how she went from being a Catholic to being uh, a unity new thought person, because that's a huge thing. Your whole life was Catholicism. You were the piano player at your church for 20 years. You know, I mean, suddenly you're like in this whole unity new thought thing. And like, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I was shown the light. Um, the, <laughs> the idea is that, for the longest time, I wanted to have my spiritual side grow. And I, I was seeking and seeking and just going to church and listening to the priest every Sunday was not enough. And I couldn't find more. Uh, I, I got involved with the Opus Dei in order to get some of their training. Um, and still that was not satisfying. And I, it was, I was, there was something missing. And then when finally I was introduced to unity and I started looking at the, the Bible in a different way. And then, and then, and then unity with all the courses that are offered, it's like, man, did I expand in the last three years? Um, but it, it made me see that, wait a minute. I, it's not that the Roman Catholic is bad, but it was so structured that it's telling you what to think. It's telling you what this is. It's telling you the interpretation. And when you get into unity where it's actually showing you that God is within, that if you actually m master the way to listen to the small voice, you get to be all that Jesus was and more. And it's like, wait a minute, that that's great because I think, I was thinking in those lines, but I wasn't able to find that. And to to be able to find that things that I thought, you know, that I was given as information and, you know, I was really the, the prescriptive na naivete, right? That you believe what the, the masters say. Exactly. Uh, and then exactly. you actually, you're able to put that in question and you go, wait a minute, Jesus never said that. It's nowhere in the Bible. Yeah. How did, huh? Wait. <laughs> so, so I've come to unity because I was fortunate to have a loving spouse who said, I'm here in my spirituality. You're there in your spirituality. And there's something called unity in the middle 
that if we go there, we can meet. And it indeed, indeed, we are meeting in unity and we are expanding from there because unity is not, here's what you have to know. Here's how to, you have to rehash it. And here's how you have to think it. And no, this is amazing. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I okay. love about that, Anne, is that, you know, when we get into new thought, um, Unity or CSL or UFBL, whoever, what happens is we are challenged to think for ourselves, yep. to make decisions for ourselves, because we are responsible for our life and the impact that it has globally, really. So if each one of us takes back our own personal responsibility rather than doing what we're told, we begin to stand out rather than fit in. Yes, absolutely. That's very well said. That to me is the uh, the excitement because I had my spiritual epiphany in a Nazarene church. I was raised without religion, but at 27, you know, my mother-in-law said, "Hey, come to church," and I wanted her to like me, so I went. Um, but what I did. <laughs> Spend <laughs> that was the only reason I went. I thought oh, I can endure an hour of this. Um, but what I discovered when I went there is the lights got turned on. I, I woke up and it was a whole new experience from there of kind of walking that path for about a year and a half and going, this isn't what my epiphany moment was. That was my oneness with this loving, loving energy. And you're talking about heaven and hell and how, you know, everybody else is going there except us. And I'm like, nah, it doesn't really resonate. And that's when I found new thought after that. So it's that journey of kind of waking up, which, you know, sort of takes us from the dinosaurs to the spirituality. Yeah, <laughs> I know. We managed to morph into a new conversation here. Way to go, see. <laughs> You brought it first full circle. <laughs> that that spiritual journey is so important. And I think, you know, doing our daily meditation and using the om, you know, that that resonance going into meditation or into prayer is pretty powerful as well. Very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, Anne, is there any particular um, practice that you found is really beneficial to you having moved from Catholicism to unity? Um, is there one thing that's been the most important to you? Wow. There's there's so many. I'm still in the hate, the, you know, the the highlight of, of learning and being exposed to so many things. When you say that three years ago, you would have talked to me about meditation and I would have said, nah, ain't gonna happen. No way can I stop this brain from, from thinking. And then yeah. to actually learn what meditation is about and to actually get to the point of being able to meditate. Um, I gave birth to three kids without having to learn Lamaze because there was no way somebody was gonna tell me how to breathe. And <laughs> Then my spouse told me that you need that to know how to breathe. I said, no, ain't going to happen. And she says, oh, yes, you have to. And so in the last three years, I've learned how to deep breathe and how yeah. that is so important. And I'm thinking, why are we not teaching these, these things to, to the first graders? Like how to breathe, how to be able to relax, how to be able to get in touch with your inner self. Because a lot of the stress and the anxiety that, you faced you would you probably wouldn't because you would know how to look at it differently and and to manage it you know and and, yeah. and i've gone from from suffering from depression to managing my depression and now to basically i just probably live with it i i don't even have to manage it that much because i'm not being impacted by it so much because yeah. i've learned to breathe i've learned to meditate i've learned to be able to do the reflection and i love so much i think of of what i have noticed is that for me is not so much going to to services that is important is to be able to take the time and have a mini retreat on a regular yeah. basis and take a book take a scripture take something and go and and read and reflect and try to put it, you know, and metaphysically interpret it. What does, how does it speak to me? 
what is yeah. what's the message I'm getting out of it? Uh, what are the lessons? It, it's yeah. it's all that I'm embracing all that right now. So I cannot say that there's one particular thing <laughs> that I do <laughs> because all of them are important. Yeah, I think I think that's the thing is there's so many elements that we begin to integrate as we learn a new model. What about you, C? How long have you been in Unity? Well, I, I visited in 2017, and then I only went for a few services. Something happened in my life. I don't remember. Disappeared yeah. for a while. Came back in 2020. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's uh, as a Sufi um, who's been at that for 36 years, I yeah. came across, because the Sufis are, are um, encouraged by their teachers, um, mm -hmm. and I did this for my students, to try everything. Yes. To understand the Tao to look into unity, to look into Catholicism, to look into Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, yeah. name it, the yogi experience. Um, when you look and you see where you fit into everything and how everything contributes to your self-mastery mm -hmm. and you're unfolding into the oneness with God, whatever you want to call it, um, it's been profound. So I knew Emily Cady long before I knew unity, right? Mm -hmm. I knew Ernest Holmes before I knew Unity or yeah. CSL. I knew all the, the, the books and the teachers, and I was reading. Um, I didn't go to the uh, churches or the communities at the time because I, I, Sufism is a very personal journey, and you just need to take what you have, go in and do your work, because it's, it's a really about working from the inside out at yes. all times. Yes. You know, you're always engaging with the heart because that is the path of the of the of the Sufi. So yeah, so unity, I came and went in 2020. Um, I wasn't willing to sit down every Sunday morning. And uh, I want to go outside and do some woodworking and play with my dogs. And but finally, <laughs> now that I've been studying uh, yeah. the new thought movement more and more and more, I just can't get enough. And I'm definitely engaged every day somehow yeah. with the new thought movement people reading classes yeah. prayer meditation and it's been great yeah that's uh, i know for me when i found it it was uh, such a natural and organic fit it was like finding my home you know mm -hmm. that energy because for me everything again comes from the heart space so it's all about love and that energy of love which to me means oneness and yeah. really acknowledging that my journey is an individual one that I must take on my own. However, how I take it and what I do with it impacts the whole because everything is connected. And so for me, that's really uh, created uh, a wonderful <laughs> a wonderful sense to life, you know, where it used to be so hard. It was such so difficult. I was so unhappy. And then all of a sudden now it's like, yeah, I have my moments, my ups and downs like everybody else. But the truth is that life is quite pleasurable and just gets better all the time. So that I'm really, really grateful for. <laughs> yes. it's, it's so good. Well, we're down to our last uh, minute and a half. Uh, final thoughts. And what final thought do you have for today's show? Um, that uh, science and religion can go hand in hand that uh when you look like i said to genesis the first three days were pr pretty much on bang on um we all come from darkness it, and and god was in everything and every and, and in everywhere then and he still is and so it, it's for me is now trying to figure out what is really my role in this? And I'm not my role as a, as a human for humans, but it's what is my role as a, as an individual in the oneness, in the oneness, you know, in the earth's system. So Beautiful. what am I here to do? Love it. See, what about you? I'm grateful that I met this amazing human <laughs> and my rock doctor. <laughs> uh, years ago and we have exploded open through the new thought movement and it's been a wonderful experience and uh, i'm grateful so thank you 
Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, and I've got <laughs> I've got my Pierre and uh, the life that we've created together over the last 21 years has been powerful and positive. And um, again, New Thought has been one of the vehicles that moves our our relationship forward as well. So full circle, full circle. Thank you so much for being here. See, thank you for being my co-host today. Thank and you. we'll have you back next week. Dr. Anne, the rock doctor, you rock girl. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. Love you all. Bye everybody. Thank you, thank you for watching. And uh, we'll be back next week with something new, something wonderful and something to explore. See y'all then. Bye. Okay.